Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Tabernacle Baptist Church. And as always, we are grateful that you have gathered together with the fellow saints this morning to worship our Lord. It's always a privilege for us to do so, but particularly on this Sunday, um, as we just left the Thanksgiving season as, and as we enter into this time of Advent, it is a privilege for us to gather together to worship the Lord today. Uh, but before we get started this morning, there is one quick announcement that I need to make sure you all are aware of, uh, and that is that there are no evening activities tonight. So uh, that's church-wide, so there's no Bible study uh, in here, there's no teen and parent study in the youth room, and there's no Awana this evening. So um, I don't want to tell you not to come. You're welcome to come, but just know if you do, uh, you're going to be hanging out in the parking lot. So if you want to tailgate with others, feel free, but uh, you won't be... Um, won't have access to the church. Uh, so no activities tonight. We will resume though uh, this upcoming week. So Wednesday night, we will have our regularly scheduled um, studies and then next Sunday night as well. So uh, just make sure you, you make notes of that. And um, so as we get started now, uh, let's go ahead and join our hearts and our minds together as we worship the Lord. Good morning. We do have so much to be thankful for, amen? So we are going to be doing our Advent candle reading this morning. It comes from 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, 14 through 15. <clears throat> but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Would y'all please stand with me this morning as we sing, Come, ye thankful people, come. Come, ye thankful people, come. Raise a song of harvest home. All is safely gathered in Ere the winter storms begin God our Maker doth provide For our wants to be supplied Come to God's own temple Come raise the song of harvest home we ourselves are God's own field, fruit unto His praise to yield. We in tears together show unto joy your sorrow grown. First and late and then the year, then the full corn shall appear. Some rain and pure me For the Lord our God shall come And shall take his harvest home From his field shall burn away All that doth open that day Give his angels charge and last in the fire the tears to cast, but the fruitful ears to 
restore in his corner evermore. Even so, Lord, quickly come, bring thy final harvest home. Gather now thy people in, free from sorrow, free from sin. Expected Jesus. We look forward to that day. Come the long expected Jesus, born to send thy people free from my fears and sins. Let us find a rest in thee. His real strength and consolation. Home of all the earth of God. Dear desire of every nation. Joy of every Thank you, Craig. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship this morning. And as you have probably figured out by now, uh, neither Pastor Scott or Pastor John are here this morning. So it is um, a blessing that we have someone like Craig in our congregation who can help lead us in worship um, in the absence of Pastor John. So thank you, Craig, for that. Um, But now we have a time uh, to turn our hearts and our minds to to corporate prayer. Time for us to, to focus Um, on the Lord. And today we're going to be praying about the second coming of Christ. So if you haven't noticed already uh, in our service, um, both the songs that we've sung and the the reading of the scripture earlier uh, has been focused on the the second coming of Christ. And we'll be talking about that some more um, in just a a few minutes. But as we pray today, we will be praying about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we will be uh, praying a prayer that's been adapted from one that comes out of uh, the Valley of Vision, which is a little prayer book um, of Puritan prayers. If you're not familiar with it, I would commend it to you. Uh, if you are you know, wondering or look, looking for some advice about how to uh, pray biblically and truthfully, it's a great resource. Or if you're just looking for um, some, some sweet prayers that might encourage you in the faith, again, I'd encourage you uh, to take a look at that, the Valley of Vision. So um, let us now go before the Lord as we pray together. O Son of God and Son of Man, you were incarnate and did suffer, rise and ascend for our sake. Your departure was not a token of separation, but a pledge of return. Your word, promises, and ordinances show your death until you come again. That day is no horror to us, for your death has redeemed us. Your spirit fills us. Your love animates us. Your word governs us. We have trusted you, and you have not betrayed our trust, waited for you, 
and not waited in vain. You will come to raise our bodies from the dust and reunite them to our souls by a wonderful work of infinite power and love. Greater than that which bounds the ocean's waters, ebbs and flows the tides, keeps the stars in their courses, and gives life to all creatures. These corruptible bodies shall put on incorruption. These mortal bodies, immortality. These natural bodies shall become spiritual bodies. These dishonored bodies, glorious bodies. These weak bodies, bodies of power. We triumph now in your promises as we shall do in their performance, for the head cannot live if the members are dead. Beyond the grave is resurrection, judgment, acquittal, and dominion. Every event and circumstance of our lives will be dealt with. The sins of our youth, our secret sins, the sins of abusing you, of disobeying your word, the sins of neglecting ministers' admonitions, the sins of violating our own consciences, all will be judged. And after judgment, peace and rest, life and service, employment and enjoyment for your elect. O God, keep us in this faith and ever looking for Christ's return. Enable us to walk in obedience as we await the triumphant reappearance of our Savior, Lord, and King. And it is in the name of the Lord, the name that is above every name, the name that will cause every knee to bow and every tongue to confess that he is Lord in heaven and on earth and under the earth, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I don't know how all of you feel, but for me, it's hard to believe that we are at the end of another year, isn't it? But with the year that we've had, perhaps some of you are looking forward to the end of 2020. Perhaps a a global pandemic and a disputed presidential election, along with all the fallout that goes along with that. um, Has many of you longing for days gone by? For some, it's perhaps the 50s or the 60s. For others, it could be the Reagan's 80s. Or maybe it's just the good old days of, of 2019. Simpler times, saner times, times when truth and good seemed more clear and not so convoluted in our nation. You know, as human beings, we often do this. We look back on the past with longing, often through what they call rose-colored glasses. We remember the best of those times and we forget the worst. But as valid of, as our memories may be of former days, There is an inherent danger that if we live with our hearts and our minds focused squarely on the blessings of the past, we may miss the blessings in the present, not to mention those that have been promised to us in the days to come. And so I think we're particularly susceptible to this at this time of year, at Advent or Christmas time. We idealize the Christmases of long ago, perhaps the ones of our childhood, as though they were somehow more pure more meaningful than those of today. And we let the season pass without it affording us the opportunity to really reflect on its true purpose. And when we do take the time to think of Advent, when we do contemplate the coming of our Lord, we tend to focus almost exclusively on Christ's first coming because it seems somehow sweeter and simpler to celebrate the miracle of God taking on flesh, of the baby born in Bethlehem and laid in a manger. But historically, this has not been the sole focus of of Christians during this Advent season. In fact, for much of church history, while the last two weeks of Advent focus on the first coming of Christ, the first two weeks of Advent focus on his second coming. And so that's what we're doing this morning. So there will surely be plenty of time for us to to look back in the months, uh, in the month to come, and to reflect on Christ's first coming. But today, we're going to focus on the future advent of our king. We're gonna focus on the second coming and discuss the implications that his coming has for how we live our lives today. So if you have your Bibles with you, would you please turn to 2 Peter chapter three. So we're gonna spend our time this morning. 2 Peter chapter three, verses one through 13. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder 
that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. It's the word of God. So as we unpack these verses this morning, we're going to spend the rest of our time really discussing three specific responsibilities that the Christian has as we await the Lord's return. And the first one is one that is simple. Um, It's a simple idea, really, but it's often difficult in practice. And so the first thing we're going to talk about this morning, the first responsibility that we have is that we are to remember the promises of Christ's return. We're to remember the promises or the promise of Christ's return. So if we were to survey the, the Bible from cover to cover this morning, we would notice that God puts an awful lot of emphasis on his people's remembering. There are passages instructing us to remember things like his commands or his past actions on our behalf or his promises for us in the future. But there's also admonitions for us to remember our spiritual condition before Christ saved us or the means by which we are to worship him. In fact, there are over 150 unique occasions in scripture in which we are specifically challenged to remember God's various characteristics, his actions, and his promises. And this is the case because our creator knows that as fallible human beings, we are naturally prone to forgetting. This shouldn't come as a surprise to us. This is the truth that we have come to recognize for ourselves. Experts generally agree that something needs to be repeated anywhere from three to 20 times before a person remembers something that they have been told. So for those who are parents in the audience, in the congregation, audience, that's the wrong word to choose, uh, in the congregation this morning, if you're a parent, that's why you may remember having to ask your children, how many times do I have to tell you? And you can fill in the blank, right? To take out the trash, to do your homework, whatever the case might be. And as my wife would attest to, this is confession time, uh, it's also why wives may have to repeat the same conversation with their husbands uh, before we remember a specific conversation about something. (laughs) Who was that? (laughs) Well, as long as your spouse caught that, then we're fine. Um, So experts may disagree on the specific number of times that we need to repeat instructions to children or to our spouses, Um, but marketing researchers, they have it down. They've actually come up with what is called the rule of seven. According to market researchers, they suggest that someone needs to hear a message seven times uh, before they will consider taking action. So research shows that that repetition is is a powerful tool because repetition leads to familiarity which turns uh, into preference. So in other words, the more we hear an idea, the more comfortable we often become with it, and the more likely we are to believe that it is true and to act upon it. And it's important for us to note here that this doesn't just work in the positive sense, but that the power of repetition even works in the negative sense. Many of us have probably heard some variation of the saying, repeat a lie often enough 
and it becomes the truth. What a lot of people don't recognize is that that saying is actually attributed to Joseph Goebbels. If you know who he was, I'm not sure, but, but if not, okay, he was the infamous uh, Nazi propaganda minister under Adolf Hitler. See, he understood the influence that reputation has on the human mind, even to sell a lie, to sell a lie to the masses that would get them to accept and to do things that they would otherwise deem unthinkable. And it's the same reason that many politi politicians today will continue to repeat a lie, even though we all know that it's not true. I'm sure all of you could fill in the, the rest of this sentence if I were to say, if you like your doctor, you can what? You can keep your doctor, right? We heard that over and over again. I'd also argue it's the, it's the repeated lie that the unborn are not human that has convinced so many in our culture to embrace the wholesale slaughter of millions of lives every year in the abortion industry. So the Lord is our creator. He knows this propensity in us. He knows the powerful influence that repetition of information has upon our minds and upon our wills. And so he repeatedly commands his people to remember truth in order that it can combat the lies and the falsehoods that we might otherwise be tempted to embrace. And we see this from our passage this morning that Peter understood this too. So if you will look back at verses one and two, Peter says, this is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. And in both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So Peter says he's writing to them a second time to impress on his readers the truths that they have already known and have been convinced of so that their sanctified minds and their spiritual discernment would be able to detect and refute the scoffers and the false teachers of their day. He didn't want them to be surprised or to be overwhelmed when unbelievers arose and challenged the validity of the Lord's return. Because Peter knew that, that scoffers would come. For, for Peter, it's not a question of if believers would be challenged by scoffers. It was a question of when. And so he says in verse three that Christians need to know first of all that scoffers will come in the last days. And when he says, first of all, we just need to understand that's not referring, uh, referring to a sequence of order, but to an order of importance. So he is basically saying that it's of first importance. It's most important that believers know, or know and understand that scoffers will arise to challenge the word of God and that it will do this in the last days. And hopefully you all are aware this, uh, of this already, but when it talks about the last days, right, according to, to scripture, biblically speaking, uh, the last days started with Christ's first coming. So we are in the last days. Uh, they're, they're not some future days that we may or may not experience, but according to God's word, Peter's original audience was living in the last days, just as we are living the last days today. So when Peter warns believers that they need to remember the predictions and the commandments of God handed down to them, through the prophets and the apostles, so that they are prepared to face the scoffing and attacks of non-believers. This admonition is just as much for us today in 2020 as it was for the Christians of the first century. And this admonition then is particularly poignant when we consider the basis of the scoffer's argument. Because I think today, uh, a lot of times as, as Christians, uh, we think that we face new challenges to our faith that previous generations didn't have to deal with. Um, I think because of the scientific advancements and, and technological advancements, it, sometimes we think that, that we have to answer questions that are more difficult than, than others had to answer. But as we're told in Ecclesiastes, right, there's nothing new under the sun. And so look at verse four. It says that the scoffers will mock and ridicule the promised return of Jesus. Why? Why? because they argue that all things are continuing as they were from the beginning. In other words, all things are just kind of chugging along like they always have. So this is really no different from the argument that's spouted by some of the most accomplished and influential atheistic academics and scientists of our day. So here we are 2,000 years on in human history and the skeptics have to resort to the same tired old argument. Today, it's what we call uniformitarianism. 
It's the assumption that the present is the key to the past, that the natural laws and processes that operate in our present day uh, have operated always uh, in the same way in the universe. This is big in geology and in some other fields as well, but but the fact that scoffers from 2,000 years ago would hold the same premise as scoffers today, or today that, that shouldn't surprise us. Because if we think about it, after all, if, if you categorically reject the existence of God, then there's really only one alternative that you're left with, and that's naturalism. And if you assume that all that exists is space, time, and matter, then it's no wonder that you would find the idea of the second coming absurd as you would with any other supernatural acts of God, because, right, from the get-go, they have taken God out of the equation. They've rejected his own existence. And so here we are 2,000 years later, and we're dealing with the same skeptical challenges to both the creation and the flood. So those major targets of the scoffers have remained the same. And we might be tempted to, to ask why these two events, right? Why are they so annoyed by the Bible's accounts of the creation and the flood? On the surface, it might seem like it's just a, an intellectual argument. And to be honest, th- th- there's an aspect of that, right? Because the word of God does in fact contradict their idea of uniformitarianism. But we need to understand that the issue is ultimately not an issue of intellect or of evidence. It's not because there isn't enough scientific or logical proof to prove God's existence that the skeptic doesn't believe. And it's not because scoffers uh, don't have the mental capacity to understand the evidence that exists. One can be very intelligent and still be a fool. That's why the Bible states that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So know that the issue is a moral issue. It's an issue of moral will. So look back at verse 5 with me. In verse 5, we see that Peter says, they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged by water and perished. They deliberately overlook the evidence. So this is not a case of accidental forgetting of events, like we were joking about at the beginning. This is actually an intentional forgetfulness. You might call it selective memory, where we choose to remember the things that we want to remember and to forget the things we want to forget. It's like the saying, forgive and forget. It's a willful decision to suppress a memory of the truth, to attempt to put away uncomfortable things that we would rather not think about or consider. And so that's the problem with the scoffers. They deliberately overlook God's existence and his works. Follow-up question might be, but but why? Why would they do this? Why would they deliberately overlook what is obviously true? Well, like I said, it's it's a moral issue. In verse 3, Peter says that they are following their own sinful desires. It's the same thing that we hear Paul talk about in Romans chapter 1. So I think we're going to have it up on the screen here for you. Romans chapter 1. And really, uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, uh, that whole passage talks about this. But for time's sake, we're going to just look at a few verses here. So in Romans 1, 18 through 20, we see Paul argue, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So the scoffer, the unbeliever, is without excuse. They will be held morally accountable by God, not because they don't know that he exists or that he demands moral righteousness, God has made that plain to all of mankind since the beginning of creation, the things that have been made. And then in Romans chapter 2, verse 15, it it tells us not only that, but God has also written his law upon our hearts and that our conscience bears testimony uh, against us when we break his law. So they're without excuse 
not because of a lack of information, they're without excuse because they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They love their sin more than they love the God who created them. They submit to the authority of their own flesh rather than the God who will judge them in righteousness. And so they willfully deny the existence for creation and God's judgment of the world of the flood because to acknowledge the reality of either of those events, let alone both of them, means to acknowledge the existence of God and man's moral accountability to a higher authority than their own. So what do they do? They try to deceive themselves into believing that denying God's existence and his coming judgment means that they can somehow avoid it. And because they want so badly for this to be true, they go against all reason and logic and against their own conscience and embrace the lie that we are all here by some sort of cosmic accident with no purpose and no meaning. It's foolishness. It's like trying to stop the onslaught of a hurricane by closing your eyes and wishing it away. So Peter's telling us here, we must not be like the scoffer, nor can we fear their derision, but we must remember the promise of Christ's return. Because the verse seven makes clear, it's the same word of God, the same power of God that created the universe and commanded the waters to flood the earth that will ensure the judgment of the ungodly. It's a foregone conclusion. It will happen. And so this brings us then to our our second point this morning. Since we know that Jesus' return is assured, then we are to remain patient as we await Christ's return. We're to remain patient. So besides forgetting the promise of Christ's return, I think another temptation for us as believers is to be discouraged when we see scoffers and the unjust succeed or prevail, especially while we see the people of God suffer and toil. And it can be easy for us to be disheartened. And for those who have been following the news lately, and yes, I remember that Pastor Scott told us not to do that. He told us to turn it off, but don't worry, he's not here today. So <laughs> we can all admit that we didn't listen to him. Uh, at least probably many of us didn't, right? We've been following what's been going on. Now, if you, if you have been watching the news lately about the, the election, and the state of our political and judicial institution, I know for many of us it's been discouraging. It seems that underhanded scheming and and cheating has been rewarded. And then we look around at the culture around us, and we see abortion and sexual deviancy of all kinds continue to increase as these sins are celebrated and promoted in our culture, even by some who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Evil is called good, and good is called evil. And we may be tempted ourselves to ask the Lord, why has he not returned yet? But it's important, church, for us to remember that that we are not the first generation to suffer things like this. In fact, this has been the consistent experience of God's people throughout the generations as they live amongst sinners and scoffers. Peter's original audience in the first century surely knew the hardships and trials of persecution at the hands of nonbelievers. And so notice then how he encourages them in the midst of this, starting in verse eight. He says, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And so the first thing that we should notice from these verses here is that the Lord's perspective on time is very different from our own. I think because we're finite beings and because our days on the earth are fleeting in light of eternity and the scripture says that we are like a mist, we're we're here today and gone tomorrow, 2,000 years and counting seems like a long time to us long enough for some to even question the validity of God's promises. But the delay of the second coming is not long from God's perspective. We exist in time. He doesn't. He's existed from eternity past, from before he spoke time into existence. And so we cannot doubt God because he is not working quickly enough according to our timetable. But we must trust that he will fulfill his promises 
for the end at just the right time, according to the plan that he had ordained from before the foundations of the world. And moreover, we, we also need to consider God's purpose and not yet bringing about the day of the Lord. God is, in fact, being patient. God is being long-suffering with mankind. When we look around and we see the evil and the injustice and the wickedness in the world around us, we often desire for, for God to bring swift justice, right? We want him to drop the hammer now. But God is motivated by his own mercy and grace just as much as by his sense of justice. Church, listen, the, the day will come when the Lord will return. That's a fact. The wrongs will be made right. The unrighteous will be justly punished. But before then, God desires to pour out forgiveness on as many as he agreed to do so. And so the reason that our present heavens and earth have not been destroyed by fire, the reason why the ungodly have not yet received their final judgment, it's not because God is a God of false promises. And it's not because his word has lost his power, that he has somehow waned in his authority. But it's because he does not wish that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And let me just pause here for a minute, because we've got to make sure we're, we're clear on this. This is not universalism, okay? Peter is not saying that God will save everyone. He's already made that clear in verse 7, right? If you look back at verse 7, he talks about a day of judgment for the ungodly. If God has set a day of judgment for the ungodly, you can believe that there will be ungodly that will be judged. Okay? So the context there is, is clear. Nor is he implying in this passage that God desires that everyone be saved, but that he is somehow not sovereign or powerful enough to make it happen. So in other words, we're not, Peter's not saying that, that God desires something that he can't accomplish. Because it's not as though God's sovereignty is, is up in the air. So if that's the case, then what does Peter mean then when he says in verse 9 that God is not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance? Well, in the context here, it's actually rather simple. He's talking about believers. And we know that from, from the immediate context here. In verse 8, Peter says, do not overlook this one fact, beloved. He, he, he's addressing the beloved. Then drop down to verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So in other words, God does not wish that any of his beloved should perish, but that all of his beloved should reach repentance. Because when we look in the scriptures, that, that language, when, whenever the beloved are referenced, it's a reference to those who are fellow believers in the body of Christ. And if you're still wrestling with, with the context here with that, um, you can even flip over to 1 Peter. And again, uh, he had already made reference to his first letter. And here in the, in the first letter, Peter, as he addresses those who he is writing to, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, right? So, so Paul has in mind uh, God's people. He, he's speaking, he's writing specifically to the people of God. And so when he says that he desires that none should perish, what we need to understand then is that God is patiently suspending his final judgment in order that he can bring in the fullness of the harvest to gather together a people for himself from every nation, tribe, and tongue. So it might seem like a fruitless um, exercise to the skeptics. It's actually purposeful and measured. So when the fullness of the harvest has been reaped, then and only then will the end come. The Lord will not return to consummate the kingdom until every last one of his chosen are brought in. And again, that should bring consolation to us this morning. The Lord will ensure that his people will be delivered. But we need to recognize this too, church, that when the appointed day comes, make no mistake, judgment will come and it's going to come swiftly. He's going to catch the world unaware. If you look back at verse 10, Peter describes the day of the Lord as coming like a thief. This language of coming like a thief is very similar to how Jesus himself described his own return in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew 24, Jesus says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. 
And I told the first service uh, this, that um, this is one of those fun passages uh, that deals with um, the nature of Jesus Christ, right, being fully God and fully man and how the omniscient God who knows all things um, and taking on humanity in this humanity, there are things he doesn't know, like the timing of a second coming. And I told the first service, if that doesn't make sense to you, you can ask Pastor Scott about it. So, uh, I'm, all, I'm half kidding. I mean, you can. <laughs> I'd also be happy to talk to you about it as well. I just don't want to waste the rest of our time discussing that today. But it is interesting, that little statement that we have here in verse 36. But, but concerning that day and the hour no one knows, in verse 37, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect." I don't know if you find this interesting. I do. To me, it's, it's very interesting that it's the flood of Noah's day that Jesus uses as the picture of a second coming. I mean, that just so happens to be one of those two specific events that Peter mentions that scoffers will reject. Ultimately, because they don't want to dwell on the thought of their own judgment. And so as in the days before the flood, when those who dismissed Noah and the warning of pending doom did so to their own destruction, millions of people today are continuing about their daily lives. They're, they're eating and drinking, they're marrying, going to work each day. Life to them is just going on as any other day. And they're thinking that God's day of judgment will never come. And when it does, sadly, it's gonna to be too late. And so the thought of lost family members, neighbors, friends, coworkers, the thought of them being swept into eternal judgment that should rightly invoke compassion from us. It should invoke fear from us, not for ourselves, but for those whom we love. It should move us to take more seriously the great commission that we have been charged with. And it should enable us to patiently endure whatever the Lord calls us to have to endure in this life, because we know that the delay of Christ's return is a manifestation of God's mercy it is because he is ensuring that not a single sheep of his sheepfold, not a single child of his kingdom is lost. And finally, the third instruction that we have as we await the Lord's return, we are to live reverently in light of Christ's return. I used another R here for alliteration purposes. Uh, reverently works. Another word you could use is faithfully, if that is more familiar to you. But we are to live reverently in light of Christ's return. Because church, what we believe does not ultimately matter unless we act upon it. Our theology can be perfect, but it wouldn't matter if the content of our faith is merely intellectual knowledge and it doesn't transform our lives. And so the fact that Jesus promised return is imminent should motivate the Christian to live a holy life. In the same way uh, that if you think of a, a marathon runner, it's the same way that they press on through the pain and they keep going. They keep putting one foot after the other, no matter how much they feel like quitting and falling out. Or how the, the prospect of maybe finally writing the check for the last payment encourages us to faithfully pay our monthly mortgages on our cars or on our houses month after month, year after year. Because I'm, I'm sure that we've all experienced this in some situation of life. We're just knowing that the end of our toil is coming, that the promised reward of all of our hard work and sacrifice is on the horizon. It gives us the motivation that we need to persevere at the task at hand. And so look again at verses uh, 11 and 13. Peter says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, 
because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in, in which righteousness dwells. Now, when Peter says there, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, let us understand that that's not a question. It's actually more of, a, an, of an exclamation. It's an exclamatory statement. He's saying in light of certain, the certain return of our Lord Jesus Christ, at which the very universe will be burned up and the works of every man laid bare before the righteous judge who will determine the fates of our very souls, it's as though Peter then is shouting to us how astoundingly excellent you ought to be, how morally upright God's children should live. And so as we wait for and we hasten the coming day of God, this is how God expects us to live. Our, our motivation for desiring the end should not primarily be the judgment of the ungodly. Though don't misunderstand me, it, it's not wrong for the Christian to desire for justice to be done but that should not be our primary motivation. Instead, our primary motivation for desiring the end to come should be the coming of the day of God. And this is not the same concept as the day of the Lord in verse 10. When you see the day of the Lord used in scripture, it points to God's special intervention into human history for the purpose of judgment. And in this context, it's dealing with the final day of judgment. But the day of God is something different. The day of God refers to what comes after the day of the Lord. After the destruction of the present heavens and the earth and the judgment of the unrighteous. It's the reason why the destruction of the heavens and the earth and the judgment of the unrighteous must first occur. Because the day of God refers to the world that exists only after God has cleansed creation of all effects of the fall, of all unrighteousness and temptation and rebellion. It is the arrival of the new creation that is untainted by sin, the new heaven and the new earth where righteousness dwells and where God reigns in the midst of his people. It is the day when all things will finally and ultimately be put in subjection under the authority of God the Father. The day when the king himself will perfect us and will banish all sickness, all mourning, all tears, and yes, even death itself from our midst. The day when God's children will not receive the shame and the punishment that we deserve for our rebellion but will be counted as co-heirs with our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the day of God that we eagerly wait for. And a lot of that, what more could we ask for? And so Peter admonishes us that if we truly long to experience a reality in which every creature lives in perfect submission to God and in perfect fellowship with God and with one another, then that should motivate us to live lives today in the here and now of holiness and godliness set apart from sin. For that's the purpose for which we have been saved. God himself has consecrated us through the blood of his son. So as we close this morning, there really are two implications, uh, or two applications of this text, I think. There's one for the non-believer and there's one for the believer. There's, there's two, two groups of people in scripture, those who are God's family and, and those who are not. And so there's two real main applications here. For the unbeliever, if you are here this morning and you've never confessed your sin and trusted in the work of Christ, the one who took on flesh and became a man to live a perfect life of obedience to his father that we were meant to live but have failed to do, and then willingly went to the cross to pay the penalty for the sin uh, that we have committed, that we deserve, If you have not done that, if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ as the one and the only one who can save you from the penalty of your sin, then the implication is, is simple. You will not look forward to this day of judgment. You will not look forward to the second advent of our Lord because it will be a day of justice and judgment for you. And so I implore you, if you have not trusted in Christ, that you would do so today. And for the believer, are you living in light of the reality of Christ's return? Because if the day of the Lord is not motivation for you to live a life of holy obedience to the Lord, then perhaps we have some repentance of our own that we need to do. Perhaps we need to be praying to the Lord that he would help us to, to see and to grasp and to cherish the great promises that he has given us 
for the days ahead. And then we need to ask that the Spirit might give us the ability to live lives of holiness. So I would ask you, if that is not you, if you find it difficult to want to live in obedience to the Lord, you know, I would commend you this morning that you have some work to do with the Lord as well, that you would uh, pray for, for forgiveness and repentance. So as we close this morning, and I'm, am I early? What's that? <laughs> I think I'm early, or I'm getting out a little bit early, so um, you can thank me for that later. But, uh, but as we close this morning, we're, we're going to close in a word of prayer. And don't worry, I am, I'm not going to make this a, a really long prayer than to make up for the time. But, but let us go before the Lord one more time and let us thank him uh, for this great promise that we have. Father God, we thank you uh, for your word. Lord, we thank you for the promises that are in your word. We thank you that you have given us your word in a book that we might be able to access your promises whenever we desire to. Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember the promise of our Lord's second coming. Help us, Lord, to be patient as we await the return of our King. Help us to be people who are about our Father's business as we await. Help us to be people who take the Great Commission seriously, who desire to make disciples of all nations, teaching people to obey all that Christ has commanded them. And Lord, we thank you, and we do look forward to the day in which Christ will return, in which we will be perfected in an instant, and we thank you for the glorious future that we have to look forward to in the new heavens and the new earth where you will reign in our midst forever and ever. So Lord, we do love you. We pray that you will use us this week as living sacrifices for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come to me.
Father of nations bind all peoples in one heart and mind. Bid and be strive and coral seas. Fill the whole world with heaven's wings. Well, what a great morning it has been to be in the house of the Lord. And what a great way for us to end the service this morning. Uh, the reminder uh, to rejoice that Emmanuel will come to us. Before we leave, just another quick reminder. Um, again, there's no evening services tonight. So I'll say it this time, don't come out, okay? Uh, there's no evening services, but we will resume those starting Wednesday night. And then also, if you came prepared to give an offering this morning, there will be uh, deacons that are at the different doors uh, that will be able to receive those um, offerings from you. So as we close today, let us do so once more by hearing from the word of God from Psalm 96, verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Praise the Lord. Go in peace.